It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I trust that you also feel that way as well. Today we're going to be examining God's Word in the book of Ephesians. It's uh, written to Christians who were at Ephesus. And I think you'll be uh, happy and pleased and understanding that some of the problems that they had there, we have here. Some of the difficulties that they had there are written probably just for us. So we'll be in chapter 5, looking at verses 8 through 14. That's going to be our focus this morning. So if I could, may I ask those of you that are healthy enough to go ahead and stand then for the reading of God's word, his holy, inerrant, and infallible word. We begin uh, reading at verse 1 of chapter 5. That'll set a little bit of the context for us. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints, nor filthiness and foolish talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no one sexually immoral or impure or greedy who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them." And now this portion is the newer portion for today's message. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Thus far are the words of today's Holy Scripture. You may be seated. Let's be mind, mindful of what Isaiah the prophet said over and over. He seems to say it to us every week. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, that's what stands forever. Incidentally, an aside here is a couple weeks ago, all I did for the sermon was read scripture. And I, I've gotten complimented so much. And, and I had to tell people right away, you know, I didn't write that stuff. Uh, but I, I do believe, and, and, and we've had friends who've actually had Bible studies where all they did at Bible studies was read the Word. And that grew. So don't ever think you can't have a Bible study in your home. Don't ever think you, you can't get the Bible uh, uh, in, into your children's minds. It can happen just simply by the reading. That's a what's called in, in, in Reformed doctrine, a means of grace. That's why we meet on Sunday. So, Scripture tells us and reminds us, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. So let's go to that great God in prayer. Dear God, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found to be acceptable in your sight because truly you are our King, our Redeemer, our Rock, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Our age, era that we live in, is an age where people tell us that it's probably best not to be known because public figures are scrutinized. Um, politicians have their tax returns examined extensively. Think about celebrities. They're burglarized because of their wealth. They're harassed. And they're even murdered sometimes. And I can understand well, how somebody might want to think uh, maybe anonymity is the way to go. 
And perhaps uh, we've all felt like that. Maybe even regarding our Christianity too. Do you often think of yourselves as a, as a, a well-known Christian in your neighborhood? Maybe a, a well-known community figure? A well-known neighbor, neighborhood figure? A grocery store figure? A, a fitness center figured? Can we, uh, can we really choose at all when we're going to be observed? In today's passage from the Bible, Paul the Apostle gives us some clear guidelines, both positive and negative, as to how we might conduct our lives. So prepare your hearts for God's message. And then follow along with me as I read from verse 8 to 14 one more time. For you were formerly darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So as our introduction, let's be considering just the light. The story of just how Jesus announced his presence in John chapter 8, has always kind of captured my imagination. It was the end of the Feast of Tabernacles in a spectacular nighttime ceremony called the Illumination of the Temple. It took place in the temple treasury in front of four really enormous golden candelabra topped with huge torches. History records that the candelabra was as tall as the highest walls of the temple, and at the top of three of the candelabrum, there were bowls with as much as 65 liters of oil in each one. There was a ladder to each candelabrum, and at the end of the evening, young men would climb up there, and they would oil up. They would uh, light wicks. Eyewitnesses said that the huge flames that left, leapt from the bowls not only illuminated the temple, but all of Jerusalem. The Mishnah, which is a collection of rabbinic uh, laws and sayings, tells us that, quote, men of piety and good works used to dance before the candelabras with burning torches in their hands, singing songs and praise and countless Levites played on harps, lyres, cymbals, trumpets, and instruments of music. From that very graphic description, one could almost feel the heat of the flames or the smell of the oil. And you can almost get caught up in the frenzy of the feast. One might imagine how thoughts would hearken back to the sojourn in the wilderness when God's presence was seen in the pillar of fire as he led the Israel nation through the desert. After that ceremony in Jerusalem, while the morning was still quiet, in the same temple treasury that had been aflame the night before, that morning entered Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. There were these great charred torches that were still in place, perhaps still smoldering. There was an acrid aroma of the revelry of the night before, probably hanging in the atmosphere. It was at that moment in time that Jesus lifted his power-filled voice above the crowd and proclaimed the words captured for us, 
in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. That had to be a wow moment. What a dynamic way to announce one of the supreme truths of existence. In essence, Jesus was saying that fire that you followed in the wilderness, that very one, that fire that came between you and the Egyptians, that very one, that cloud that guided you by day, that flame that illuminated the tabernacle last night, the glorious cloud that filled Solomon's temple, he says, was me. I am the light of the world. Whoever allows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. That truth has never been more true than in our text today. When Paul writes, For you were once darkness, but now you are light. In essence, today, the genuine Christian is light in this world. Reflected light of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our light comes from him. None of it starts with us. Not a single ray. Like Peter says in 2 Peter 2.14, we participate in the divine nature. Our light in him is so real that in eternity, the Bible says in Matthew 13.43, the righteous shall shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. And incidentally, we shine right now. Take it or leave it, we shine right now. Listen to this same Paul as he wrote in another prison epistle, this time in Philippians, beginning in chapter 2, verse 12, and continuing on for a few verses, here's what Paul said. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Don't miss this. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Literally, this says, among whom you are already shining as lights in the in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, Paul said, I will have reason to boast because I did not waste my time, because I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And then he adds, but even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. And you also rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. So, fellow Christians, because we are light, we are faced with a huge responsibility in the world. How are we to live? We who have been transferred from the darkness into the light, how are we to live now? Paul speaks of the positive side and then the negative side. So first, positively, let's study the, the directions for the people of the light. Verse 7 says, Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all, one, goodness, 
Two, righteousness. And three, truth. Trying to learn what's pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. So what is the fruit of the godly character that Paul is exhorting his followers to adopt? Threefold. Goodness, which means beneficence or generosity. And then righteousness, which has shades of integrity in all your dealings with God and man. And then thirdly, truth, which is the absence of falsehood and deceptions. These are the ethics of light. Walk that way or literally order your behavior that way. Be habitually conducting yourselves as children of light. And we're told, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, literally prove them. Put them to the test for the sake of proving their genuineness. And then and only then, put your seal on them. Find out what pleases God and do it. God's children are the lights of the world. Let me just take an aside and see how many folks smile at this. But Did you ever have one of those toys that you were supposed to put under the light during the day and then at night it would glow in the dark? Some of you know that. Yeah, I had a cross. As a little kid, I had a cross. And on those peculiarly... Um, Scary nights. I don't know what I was thinking as a kid, but I, I was scared. But I recall looking to that cross for peace and assurance. But the directions on the object itself, here's what it said. If you want me to shine in the dark, keep me in the light. That story could be us today. Our lives are like photographic plates when we're exposed to his image and his presence his character is burnt into ours we, we need to open our Bibles and allow the truth to light our faces and light up our lives so what's the positive direction for the children of light well, be involved in habitually bearing the fruit, goodness and righteousness and truth, and always be testing that for genuineness. And as you already know, there are certain prohibitions for the people of the light as well. In this life on earth, you can bet that there are some negatives. Matter of fact, I'm sure you've already experienced them. So what are those prohibitions for the people of the light? Verse 11 says, And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So we are to have nothing to do with these fruitless deeds of darkness. Nothing really good happens in the dark, does it? Disease breeds in darkness. Germs multiply in darkness. Darkness brings death to plants and to animals alike. Darkness shelters the evil and sinner alike. Night seemingly has no shame. Let me just comment here. Light promotes life, not darkness. Another way to say that, pus attracts pus. It's a curious thing when someone 
has an appendectomy. But, but it's another thing when the appendix bursts, when it's still inside. And when it bursts, then this little pocket, which has pus in it, kind of explodes. And you'll note that those people are not released from the hospital on the same day. Or they're going to have to return to the physician or the surgeon within two weeks. Why is that? Pus attracts pus. The doctor tries his very, very best to flush out that area of the abdomen, but still some pus hangs around the corners and immediately begins to multiply. And so there's another infected sac in there that he has to go back in and pierce so that he can get out more pus. It's a gross way to say it, but that's what, that's what he's waiting for is all the pus in the wound to congregate together to make his task a little easier. Our text says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. There is a tension point in our culture today because it seems as though the great, great sin of our culture is what it perceives as intolerance. The non-Christian has come to think that the great Christian virtue ought to be tolerance of anything. Christians who form judgments in their eye, in the eyes of unbelievers, are somehow thought to be sub-Christian or sub-logical. The universal motto today might be, the one thing I will not tolerate is intolerance. It's true, isn't it? It's, it's an odd time we live. To many, it seems that Christianity exists to make us a, a broad and accepting group. And there are clergy who actually kind of put their imprimatur on, so to speak, the clergy that, that baptizes every form of sin also. Uh, if, I, if I put on a, a cultured accent, maybe, and I wear a, a fuchsia colored bishop's shirt, maybe even have a pipe in my mouth, and, and I urge the world's people to place condoms in Gideon's Bibles. This world, if that were me, this world would reserve a seat for me on Good Morning America tomorrow. Our culture loves the open-minded. I consider those empty-headed people, but open-minded, non-judgmental, live and let live personality, especially if that individual hates intolerance and even growls his distaste for the narrow-minded. Listen, if you, as a genuine Christian, are narrow-minded around the truth, there's nothing wrong with you at all and everything wrong with the world. Don't let anyone ever talk you out of that position. Let me tell you what God's word says. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. God does not stomach the world's luxuries toward intolerance. God has rules. Christianity is exclusive, not inclusive. God told his people not to touch the Ark of the Covenant. There were rules for handling it. Once, when it was being transported on an ox cart, a man named Uzzah reached out just to stabilize the cart and he seemed to have touched the ark. God killed that man instantly, right on the spot. It, it makes me shudder because as a human, I know so little about this attribute of God called holiness. 
And holiness is not going to have anything to do with disobedience. And that's where Uzzah was. Adultery, friends, is sin. You can love the sinner. But if you know it's a sin, then call it that way. Today we need people in our culture who will hate sin and call it sin. Materialism is sin, friends. Neglect of the poor is sin. Child neglect is sin. Even if it presents itself in a nice-looking suburban wrapper. Uh, We need ethical people shedding ethical light in our community. We need integrity in the office, in the classroom, In essence, you're counting on me and I'm counting on you to bring that message in the shop, in the church. Our culture desperately needs the church. It needs the well-lit church that loves sinners and broadcasts that the only way to heaven is Jesus the Christ. The text says, awake, sleeper. Arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let me move now to application. Let's talk about my light. I want to illustrate this point here uh, by reading a rather lengthy piece. So if you have to get up in the middle and leave, I understand that. But uh, This is by a man uh, named Robert Fulcom. Any of you know that? He wrote a famous book about two decades ago. Um, You know the book, uh, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Well, everything you needed to know about God, he did learn in kindergarten. Um, And I have on your note there to note that he's a Unitarian Universalist. Uh, Okay, and so that's kind of a very mixed bunch of people. Anyway, he wrote that he had calculated, and he's still alive, so these hours will go up, but he wrote that he had calculated in his life, so far, he had spent 35,000 hours eating, 30,000 hours in traffic, getting from one place to another, 2,508 hours just brushing his teeth, 870,000 hours just coping with odds and ends, filling out forms, repairing things, paying bills, getting dressed and undressed, and 2,000, uh, no, 207, 217,000 hours he'd been at work. He said there is not a whole lot left over when you get finished adding and subtracting. He said the good stuff has somehow been fitted in somewhere. Which is why he often, he, he's still speaking here, which is why I often say it's not the meaning of life, it's the meaning in life. All of us have attended lectures which end with the speaker asking, are there any questions? On such occasions, Fulham says he usually asks the most important question of all. What is the meaning of life? He says that the question is, Never taken seriously, people laugh and nod and gather up their things and the meeting ends on that ridiculous note. But once, when he asked that question, to his surprise, he got a serious answer. It came from Dr. Alexander Papaderos, a Greek philosopher and teacher and founder of an institute on the Isle of Crete that was dedicated to human understanding and peace. One summer, Fulham attended a two-week seminar at the Institute. At the conclusion of the final session, Dr. Papaderos asked, are there any questions? So Fulham asked, what is the meaning of life? The usual laughter followed and people stirred to go. Papaderos held up his hand and stilled the room and looked at me for a long time, asking with his eyes if I was serious. And seeing from my eyes that I was, 
I will answer your question, he said. Then taking his wallet out of his hip pocket, he fished into a leather billfold and brought out a very small round mirror about the size of a quarter. Let me stop there. I used this as an illustration one time in a church that I pastored in California. And a man left that day and came back the next week with these, just like this, just like this. Here's what uh, Papadero said. Folks, I was a small child during the war. We were very poor and lived in a remote village. A German soldier's motorcycle had been wrecked in that place. I tried to find all the pieces and put them together, but it was not possible. So I kept only the largest piece, this one. And by scratching it on a stone, I made it round. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into dark places where light would never shine, in deep holes and in crevices and dark closets. It became a game for me to get light into the most inaccessible places I could find. I kept the little mirror, and as I went about growing up, I would take it out in idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. As I became a man, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game, but a metaphor that I am not the light or the source of the light, but light, truth, understanding, knowledge is there, and it will only shine in many dark places if I reflect it. I am a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, I can reflect into the dark places of this world. I only know of one despicable sinner here. So let me try to get the angle just right. Perhaps others may see as he said he did, and do likewise. He said, this is what I am about. This is the meaning of my life. Then he took his small mirror and holding it carefully, caught the bright rays of daylight streaming through the window and reflected them onto my face and onto my hands folded on the desk. So let's ask and answer the question. The question is, how are we who have been transferred from darkness into light to live? And the answer that we have from the text is, walk in goodness, righteousness, and truth, proving and testing and desiring to validate the good, and then remembering to have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. We need to awaken sleepers. We also need to blind people by reflecting brilliantly clear, attractive, godly, and God-initiated light. And then we would ask, are you ready to reflect into the dark places of this world Christ's light? Is it about time that you take that wonderfully blinding light that has been granted to each one of you and reflect it back to a dark neighborhood or a dark family or a dark job. The light that he has shown on us is for us to reflect to those around us. Just, just think with me of the chorus that, that, that I, I love and we sing it often in this church. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Now listen to what he says. Melt me. I mean, shape me. Melt me. Mold me. Shape me. Melt me. Mold me. Fill me. Use me. 
Spirit of the living God fall afresh on me. Easy to remember. We should be reciting it to ourselves daily. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, to be a light in a dark world. Help us, Lord, to be light here in League City. Embolden us, Lord, to see the screaming need around us. Help us to find wonderful ways to remind our friends and relatives and neighbors that this is the place and they must understand the exclusivity of Christianity. It's God who told us these things. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.